Ninurta Imdigud and the Tablet, Part 1 The heroic storm god Ninurta was well known for his deeds even before this. He was a leader among the Anuna gods. Like Inanna, Ninurta flowed over warriors in battle, giving them strength and ferocity. Even Gala demons, a form of demon that never tired, feared his attack. Our story begins in the early days. The rivers had long been flowing across the land, but some parts of the order of the universe were still being organized. A storm had just raged across the land. It was at this time that the Egigi gods gathered before Enlil, leader of the gods. They had seen something that their lord needed to know about in the aftermath of the storm. On the mountain of Hehe, a wooded mountain in the lap of the Anuna gods, there is a fearsome creature. This is the Imdigud bird, and it was born of the recent great flood that swept across the land and down the mountain. Enlil immediately took action based upon the information that had been presented by the Egigi gods. He traveled to the mountain to inspect the creature. With him was Anki, the wise and clever god of fresh waters. The creature had the head of a lion and the wings of an eagle. His very form suggested aggression on earth and in the heavens. He had a roar like thunder, and his talons were as strong as those of a lion. Where has this creature come from? What god or force gave birth to a creature of this ferocity? This ferocity. Enlil was amazed at the raw power of the creature. No doubt the flood had brought up the pure waters deep under the earth, Enki answered Enlil easily. This is what gave birth to him. He was born in the rocks and the earth, and his name is Imdigud. And what should be done with him? Enlil asked Enki to decide upon the destiny of the creature. Let him serve you ceaselessly, guarding your throne in your innermost chamber. Enki could see how the Imdigud would make a natural guardian. For thousands of years after this, Imdigud would serve as guardian for the people of the land. He and others like him would use Imdigud statues over doorways as vessels protecting the chamber within. Enlil took the lion-headed bird as a guardian. He reminded the bird every day of his duty. The Imdigud guarded the entrance to his inner chambers. The bird enjoyed bathing in the pure waters of Enlil's holy water basin. As he did this, enjoying the, he enjoyed gazing at the finery of power. He gazed upon Enlil's crown, robes, and particularly upon the Tablet of Destinies in Enlil's hand. Imdigud decided that he would take the trappings of power. In days gone by, Enki had, in, had been instructed to set up the order of the universe. He recorded this order upon tablets and gave them to the gods who decree fate. The mere possession of this tablet would give one power of the gods who decreed fate. It was this power that the Imdigud covered. It would give him the power to predict and shape the future. I will take the Tablet of Destinies for myself. I will gather the responsibilities of the gods for myself. I will have the throne for myself, and with it, I will have lordship over each and every one of the Igigi gods. Imdigud patiently waited for his opportunity to strike. He watched Enlil's actions day after day and thought about how he would make off with the Tablet of Destinies. His opportunity finally came when Enlil was bathing in his holy water basin. Enlil was not wearing his crown or robes, and he was not holding his Tablet of Destiny. 
His attention was focused upon making himself physically and ritually clean in the baptismal waters of the holy water basin. Moving quickly, Imdegud stole the Tablet of Destinies belonging to Enlil. This one action reversed the order of the universe. Imdegud now had the power of one of the gods who decreed fate. He soared off to his mountain, where he determined to make his home. Silence spread within Enlil's chambers. Enlil was speechless. What had just happened was unthinkable. His innermost sanctum was stripped of its divine splendor. All of the gods of the land gathered. What had happened was not just unthinkable, but it was also unacceptable. They needed to come up with a plan to re-establish the proper order of the universe, as it had been decreed by the wise god Enki. Who will be the one to slay Imdegud and take back the Tablet of Destinies? An, god of heaven and father to both Enlil and Enki, asked of the assembled gods. Whoever does this will have his name spoken in every home. The first to be called was Ishkur, the lord of irrigation. He was a powerful storm god, and his heroic exploits were well known among the shepherds through all of Sumer. Ishkur was one of An's own children. He wielded lightning as a weapon, and he was master of the lion dragons. The assembled gods addressed the god Ishkur. Ishkur, you are truly mighty. You have been victorious many times in the past. Would you now attack Imdegud with your weapon? Father, Ishkur addressed An as chief among the gods, I am not so foolish as to attack a remote mountain. This Imdegud bird is more than a monster. He took the Tablet of Destiny from Enlil. His words are now holy and powerful. If he could turn anyone who went up against him to clay if he simply uttered the correct words. The gods were more than a little disappointed that this powerful god would not go up against the Imdegud bird. There were, however, other gods. There were many powerful warriors among the assembly of the gods. The one they turned to next was the god of fire, Gibil. He was a powerful destroyer, but he was more known for his talents at building. It was him that made the baking of both bread and bricks possible. He transported burnt offerings to the gods. It was by his fire that some of the strongest weapons in all of Sumer were forged. Will you use your weapon against the Imdegud bird? If you do, then your name will be, spoke, will be known throughout the land. The assembled gods asked him, knowing that he was a mighty warrior, but fearing that he might say no. He answered just as Ishkur had. He likened the Imdegud bird to a remote mountain. He told, as Ishkur had, that possession of the Tablets of Destiny would make the bird untouchable. They then called to Shara, who was An's personal warrior. He was beloved of Nana, and was called her son by some. It would explain his affinity for both the war goddess and the arts of war. More than this, though, he was Inanna's singer, manicurist, and even her hairdresser. He was a perfect complement to Inanna's finer taste as well as her warrior disposition. Unfortunately, like Gabil and Ishkur before him, Shara would not lift his weapon up against the fearsome bird with a lion's head and lion's claws. He answered exactly as they had and the gods were forced to look to another hero. The problem was that these three were three of the greatest heroes. The Agigi gods held a council to discuss the problem. They debated the problem and, as is often the case with well-crafted councils, the wisest one present came up with some of the most important thoughts. Anki, Lord of Wisdom, who made his home deep within the Apsu, pondered the problem. He took his thoughts to the Lord of Heaven, An, his father, and Dagon, one of Enlil's attendants. 
I believe I can find the hero you are seeking. Let me appoint the one who will be the conqueror of the Imdegood bird in the assembly. Hearing that Anki had an idea, the Agigi praised him. They knew how clever Anki was and knew that if he thought that there was a way that there could actually be if he thought that there was a way that there actually was, their spirits were raised. Enki requested that An and Dagon bring a particular goddess to the front of the council. This goddess was named Ninmina. She was a goddess of motherhood, who already as well respected among the gods. Enki had her brought forward so that all of the gods could honor her. Ninmina, you are respected you are a respected counselor among the gods, Enki began, praising her for her past accomplishments and for who she was. You are one of our most respected sisters. We have known you as N Ninmina. Now we will also know you as the mistress of all the gods. This statement recognized her ability to give good advice and teaching. It was now important to seek one who had benefited from that teaching. Ninmina had raised a singular warrior. We humbly request that you give us the warrior Ninurta and his weapon Sharur. He will be given a place as an advisor to this council, and he will be given a central place of honor in many of the festivals of the great cities of Sumer. Nimina consented to give her son over to this challenging quest. The assembled gods were true to their word. Ninurta had yet had not yet returned the tablet to Enlil, but it had given hope to the gods. When all was decided, Ninmina spoke words of encouragement and advice to her son. Ninurta and Imdigud were both gods of storm. They were closely matched in many ways. Strike as hard as you can, but choose your moment carefully. You will need to strike him with your most brutal winds. Flood the land where he was born in order to bring chaos to his home. Attack him with poisoned arrows. Strike him with whirlwinds and use a mist to obscure your features. Shroud him in darkness by building up the storms above him. She outlined several tactics that could be used against the Thunderbird. Ninurta was a storm god, and most of the tactics that Ninmina suggested reflected this. Flashes of lightning, mist, and resounding darkness could be used to blind his opponent. Whirlwinds and strikes of lightning were attacks that could move quickly to strike at an enemy. Not all of the strategic advice had to do with storms. They were definitely a part of it, but it was more about knowing how to use them to the greatest advantage. Ninurta had a powerful sickle sword named Shurur, who would give more tactical advice during the fight. Ninurta headed out to the Hehe mountain to meet the Imdigud bird in battle. He took with him seven ill whirlwinds. He was shaking with fury and was filled with anger. Ninurta, Imdigud, and the Tablet, Part 2 Shurur, Ninurta's sickle sword, swung upwards. It struck the Imdigud bird soundly and caused him to drop the Tablet of Destinies. The Tablet fell from the talons of the great Thunderbird, and it fell into the deep. All of the great hopes for power that the mighty bird had were taken from him and replaced with a feeling of bitter failure. As master of the deep, Enki took hold of it. He had originally crafted the tablet at the order of Enlil, and he, would, he had been the one who had placed it in his brother's hands. Enki stood to gain nothing from keeping the power from his brother Enlil. Imdegud fell to the ground, and power fell from him. Ninurta and his sword were there where he fell. The great bird of aggression mourned for his own loss of power. He had come so close to greatness only to lose it. When you struck me on the orders of your mother, 
your weapon, stripped me of the hopes that I had for power. The tablet of destinies fell from my hand into the great deep of the Abzu. I lost everything. Ninurta was taken back by the words of the bird that he had defeated. You lost everything. What about me? Ninmina asked. When you were struck, the tablet didn't fall into my hands. I will not be one of those who decree destinies. I will not l live in luxury in a palace in the absolute like Enki. Ninmina, the lady of the crown, was just as bitter even though she didn't truly know the power that had never been hers. The bitterness abounded. Enki was an expert at determining de destinies, and he knew the sorts of plans that his bitterness, what, that this bitterness would cause. A plot was afoot, and Enki knew about it instantly. The Imdegud bird and Ninurta went to the palace of Enki in the Apsu. Enki knew that the great hero was coming and greeted him as befitted a hero. Enki may have known that he was being plotted against, but the great gods judged people on what they had done and not what they might do in the future. Well done, Ninurta. You are truly a hero. None of your brother gods could have accomplished what you managed to do easily with your mighty weapon. Turning to the matter of the Imdugud bird that had stolen the great tablet of destinies, Enki decreed a terrible destiny. As for the bird that your mighty weapon has struck from the sky, I decree that from now on, until the end of time, you will always have your foot upon its neck. You will always be able to defeat the Imdugud bird at any time. Ninurta was gracious with his acceptance of these lavish decrees, but he wanted more. He was not content with a hero's due. He wanted the Tablet of Destinies and all of the power that it could grant him. The great gods should give you your strength and heroism its due as well, Enki continued. He heaped praise on Ninurta just as he heaped decrees, and Lil will grant you whatever you wish. You are so great a champion that Ninmina will never fashion your equal. Let your glory never be equaled, and let no god surpass you in heroism. Ninurta acted graciously, but he was not happy with what he was being promised to him. Enki had crafted the Tablet of Destiny, and Lil had commissioned it to govern the lives of the gods of, of the gods and man. Ninurta wanted this power for himself. Envy turned to greed, and greed turned to rebellion. Ninurta set his sights on the four quarters of the world. Even he, with his sword and army of demons, would not be able to take it by force, but clever rebellion might do the trick. He told nobody of his plans, as he wanted nobody to interfere with them. Enki was able to see the plan shaping in the future from within his home in the Absu. There he gathered to him a deluge that would cause a flood. Ninurta returned to Enki's home, but was confronted by Enki's minister, Izumud. Ninurta would not submit to Izumud, and so he raised his hand against him. Unhindered, the storm god continued into Enki's house in the Apsu. Enki had crafted a turtle from clay that he had found in the deep. He placed him near the threshold of his home as a trap. When Ninurta entered the house, the turtle bit him on the tendon. Explain this, Enki demanded. Ninurta, being a powerful warrior, was able to push back the turtle, but the turtle still had hold of his tendon. Enki commanded the turtle to dig a hole and pull the both of them in. Ninurta was unable to escape from the pit, and the turtle kept biting and clawing with its feet. You set out to kill me, Enki told the storm god. You've shot too high this time. You are granted a high position among the gods. But what has this brought you? You were given great strength and heroism. You wrought, you wrought great destruction in the mountain. But how are you going to get out of this pit? 
Ninmina learned of her son's plight promptly. She prostrated herself before Enki and begged him for her son's freedom. She begged him to spare her son from his prison in the pit and offered many potential servants to him. Ninurta did not lose his place among the gods. He was not held prisoner forever. We do not know what sort of bargain Ninmina and Enki struck, but Enki was always a protector of order. It would, would, it would have been customary for some reasonable exchange. Imdigud, the bird who stole destiny, was always seen over Enki's shoulder hereafter. His kind of bird can be, can be seen over doorways as a protector of the home. A mother, Imdigud, and her nest appeared later in the Gilgamesh myths. Enki and Enlil continued in their place at the head of the Pantheon. End of Part 2「Ninurta met Imdugud on the side of the mountain, but the Imdugud bird was ready. The bird covered the entire mountain with his aura. He roared like a lion as he did this. His fury knew no bounds. I have carried off the Tablet of Destiny. I have the power to change the duties of the gods. Imdugud roared with the sound of a cyclone. Who are you to come and challenge me? Explain yourself. I am the upholder of the land of Kur as established by Enki, Lord of Destinies. I am here to avenge Enlil. I am here to crush you. At this, Imdigud shrieked from his mountain. The entire land grew dark under the clashing storms. The mountain was hidden from the light of Utu, the sun god. Ishkur's lightning struck here and there with terrible storm, and he roared in the thunder cracks. Within the clash of storms, Ninurta clashed with Imdigud. Armor bathed in blood shoved. Within the storm of death, a deluge of arrows fell down with the pouring rain. At this point, the confusion of battle was at its greatest. Ninurta chose this moment to knock a single arrow into his bow. He was a mighty warrior, and the hopes of An and Dagon were upon his shoulders. He loosed this arrow at Imdigud. The arrow, the arrow did not strike him to good. It did not even come close. Instead, the arrow turned back and returned to inert, Ninurta. Shaft, return to your thicket. Bowstring, return to your sheep. Bow, return to the forest. Feather, return to your bird. Imdigud was able to make good his command, his command because he held the Tablet of Destinies. He was like one of the seven, and his decrees were carried out. Battle quickly began to die down at this point. The charge was held back, and Imdigud held his mountain. Ninurta now needed to find out what had gone wrong and how to deal with it. Enki, who was the most clever of the gods, would be the one to ask. He drew forth Sharur, the sickle sword, and gave it a task. Tell, tell Enki what you saw here. Tell him particularly of how Imdigud turned back the arrows. The sword Sharur praised the greatness of his master, as was tradition, and then did as he was told. He reported quickly to Enki what he had seen. My lord Ninurta and his forces had surrounded Imdigud. When the moment was right, he launched an arrow against the bird. Shorur told the exact phrase that the Imdigud bird had used and gave all the details surrounding it. Enki listened and thought the matter over. He then gave instructions and told Shorur to remember his words exactly. There was a major flaw in Imdigud's tactic, and the Lord of Freshwater saw it. Don't overexert yourself, as you will need to tire him out. Once he tires, his wingtips will begin to drop. Cut off his wingtips and throw him in every direction. He will be distressed by the sight and will momentarily be speechless. Launch your arrows at this point, 
making sure to use Imdegud feathers in one. Ninurta engaged in battle with Imdegud in an effort to tire his enemy out. Once the great bird's wings were dropped low enough, Ninurta took Shurur and cut off his wingtips. He let the feathers fly everywhere and prepared an arrow at this time. Imdegud saw the arrow, commanded it as he had before. The arrow, however, did not fly back to its quiver. The arrow made with Imdegud's own feathers returned to the bird, taking the shaft along with it. It was at this point that Ninurta struck with his sword. The tablet was returned to the gods, and Lil was restored to his place at the top of the pantheon. Ninurta was praised and given a place of honor among the gods for his heroic deeds. He set up his place of worship throughout Sumer. The order of the universe was restored. But the story did not end there. Imdegud had been the had not been the only one to covet the Tablet of Destinies. He had simply been the most aggressive. And that is the end of part one.